Here is Robert Trout with five minutes of the latest news. It's a gray winter Sunday in most of the northeastern states. Snow flurries, sleet, and freezing rain. In Philadelphia, a National Airlines four-engine plane bound from New York to Norfolk, Virginia, with 22 passengers aboard, came in to land at Philadelphia's International Airport and crashed on the runway. Seven persons killed, 16 apparently survived the crash. The weather's bad in Korea, too. Bitter cold around Wanju, where the United Nations defense line is now threatened by enemy troops who are up to their old trick of slipping around behind the Allied positions and who seem to be just as successful at it as ever. United Nations intelligence officers on the spot estimate that between 7 and 30,000 North Korean communist troops are now in position some 20 miles behind the United States 2nd Division in that Wanju sector on the East Central Front. And that's just one place where the Reds have infiltrated. Major General Robert McClure, the 2nd Division commander, has been replaced abruptly by Major General Clark Ruffner. No major fighting reported at the moment from Korea. The biggest military news comes from Tokyo today with the bare announcement that the two top United States intelligence officers and the Army and Air Force Chiefs of Staff are in Tokyo and have had a three-hour Sunday conference with General Douglas MacArthur. We don't know what the meeting is all about. In fact, everything has been cloaked in secrecy, including the arrival in Japan of General Beetle Smith, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, General Alexander Bowling, the Army Intelligence Chief, General Lawton Collins, the Army Chief of Staff, and General Hoyt Vandenberg, who's the Air Force Chief of Staff. At first, the Tokyo censors would not allow the newsmen there to report that all four generals had indeed gathered in Japan. In Washington, the Pentagon says the meeting's just a coincidence and is of no special significance at all. Congressmen in Washington are waiting for President Harry Truman's message on the budget, which everybody expects is going to call for some $70 billion for the coming fiscal year. The Republican Party's minority leader of the House, Representative Joseph Martin of Massachusetts, didn't even wait for the budget message to be delivered tomorrow. He's already attacked it today, saying the president is trying to turn the United States into a socialist economy. Taxpayers around the world will notice with interest the report today from a small town in France where the local blacksmith has been arrested for threatening murder because he sent a miniature coffin to the tax collector. The big Senate fight on foreign policy may break wide open tomorrow if Nebraska's Republican Senator Kenneth Worry gets a chance to bring up his resolution forbidding the president to transfer American troops to Europe without congressional approval. Illinois' Democratic Senator Paul Douglas has now joined those who say the president should ask for Congress's approval, not because he has to, he doesn't, but for the sake of national unity in the crisis. The administration hopes the issue will be settled when General Eisenhower returns from his European tour and reports to Congress, as he probably will do. Today, General Eisenhower is resting in London before tomorrow's big meeting with British Defense Minister Emmanuel Shinwell and the British Chiefs of Staff, who are expected to offer to double British arms production and also make more fighting men available as part of the Atlantic Alliance's rearmament. Britain is still struggling against that severe influenza epidemic. Graves are being dug at night in the light of flares, and a quarter of a million persons are now ill with influenza in northern England alone. In Germany, West German Chancellor Adenauer says the Allies can have German soldiers to help fight communism, but only at the price of absolute equality for the Germans. In Moscow, Joseph Stalin's son, who's an Air Force general, has now been nominated for a seat in the Supreme Soviet, which more or less corresponds to a parliament. And the Soviet government has just given out the annual prizes to mothers who have the most children. The 1950 winner now has 12, and she won 65,000 rubles. At the moment, the ruble is worth 20 cents. There's hard fighting reported today in Southeast Asia, where the French say they've beaten off the Indo-Chinese communist-led rebels who made a big attack on the defense line 60 miles long that protects Hanoi. All the French tell us is that they did it with artillery. And in Paris, the Lafayette Society announces that Margaret Truman is going to sing in Paris and, of course, in the spring. Listen again next Sunday at the same time for Robert Trout and the latest news. Enjoy Tallulah's Big Show with Jimmy Durante today on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Counter Spy. Harding, counter spy, calling Washington. United States counter spy. 
especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. Tonight's counter spy report to the American people is brought to you in cooperation with the New York State Civil Defense Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Baltimore and to the national headquarters of Super America Incorporated. And here is the chairman of Super America Incorporated, Henry Harrison Hector. I have called this emergency meeting of you, our key Super America leaders from all over the country, to discuss the new crisis confronting our nation. The possibility of attack from the air by conventional means and, we fear, atomic bombs. All over the country, citizens are rallying to their local civil defense organizations. But, as in every crisis, everything cannot be left to government officials. It is up to us, super-Americans, to provide leadership. Wherever patriotic work is to be done, there you must see a super-American. Should disaster strike from the skies, it will be our super-American task to form the very backbone of civil defense. I, uh, I see that you all understand. Presently, my secretary, Della Crane, will hand you your individual assignment sheets. We must make the civil defense of the United States our great objective. Thank you for your attention. Very good speech, Mr. Hector. I'll be sorry to lose you, Della. Are you sure you and Steve will be happy in Finsburg? No, but I'll do my best. Steve's already been out there, found an apartment and a job. The bonds between super-Americans are very strong. Better excuse me, Mr. Hector. I've got to give out the assignment sheet. By all means, Della. <laughs> Give us just a few weeks, and I think we super Americans will turn civil defense into civil collapse. Um, let's continue, shall we, ladies and gentlemen? As you know, my name is Blair, I'm the zone director. I'm very happy to see so many new volunteers here tonight. During this week, I expect to make the final assignments. Aircraft spotters, communications helpers, medical aid helpers, and so on. I feel that uh, by the end... Un- Mr. Blair, may I ask a question? I, certainly, Mr. Crane. Well, do I understand you correctly that assignments haven't all been made yet? Well, that's right, Mr. Crane. Most of the time so far has been spent in planning. Uh, does that cover your question? Well, uh... Yes, I guess so. For now, anyway. As I was saying, ladies and gentlemen, most of the time has been spent in planning from the top down. We get our overall plans from the National Civil Defense Headquarters in Washington, then through our state director, down through our city director here in Finsburg. Since this particular zone covers the most important industrial section of the city, this building is the main control center for the entire city. Now, are there any radio hams among you? Amateur radio operators? Yeah, well, I know, I know. Two, three, four, four. That's fine. That's fine. After the meeting, will you please report to Mr. Avery? That's Mr. Avery over by the window. You'll become the nucleus of a special squad to go right to the scenes of any disasters and report back by radio. Now, the next... Pro- yes, Mr. Crane? Um, say, Mr. Blair, I... Uh, I'm new here, and maybe I oughtn't to open my yap, but... Uh, say, would you mind if I uh, come right up front there so everybody can hear me? No, not at all. Come right ahead. I, I just take this whole thing so darn serious. Uh, well, folks, uh, my name's Steve Crane, and I just hit this fine city of yours today, and, boy, from what I've seen so far, I'm going to be mighty happy about it. Yes, sir. Well, um... I've been sitting and listening to the interesting things Mr. Blair's been outlining, and I'm here to say that everything sounds great. 
The only trouble is, and I, I don't know just what we can do about it, the trouble is not much is definite. So much is still in the, in the planning stage, you know what I mean? Well, uh, Mr. Crane, I might explain no, to you... I know you we... can't just do things without planning. <laughs> We're all intelligent enough to know that, but here's what bothers me. Suppose somebody drops a bomb on us tomorrow. Where are we? Hiding our heads under a plan? No, I, I, I hate to criticize, and I... No, I don't want any of you to think that that's what I'm doing, but holy smoke, what's been going on here since the trouble started in Korea way back in June? Mr. Crane, I think you ought to realize... Oh, that I we... know, I know these things take time, but we've got to work faster. Nothing's any good. Being almost ready is like not being ready at all. Holy smoke, we'd all be better off getting out of the city. Now, what do you say we all... Mr. Crane, please. I understand that to a newcomer like yourself, it may seem we've done very little. But I don't want anybody here to forget the enormous amount of work that's been done. Why... Sure, sure, Mr. Blair, I'm right behind you. And like I said, I, I don't want to talk out of turn, but... I don't want anybody to kid themselves. How much time do you think we've got? We've got to Ladies get and gentlemen, please. We don't do please, let's have some order and discipline here. Ladies and gentlemen, please. To Counter Spy Headquarters from District 3, City 9. Local civil defense moving very slowly here lately. State director believes people generally unaware of real danger. This field offers lending personnel to step up recruiting. Two counter spy headquarters from District 19, City 3. Civil defense here at virtual standstill. Volunteers not carrying out assigned duties. This field office consulting with director will advise. And we've been getting them like that from various spots all over the country, Mr. Hunting. Strange. A sort of a sudden paralysis. The national director of civil defense thinks that people just don't realize the danger. I wonder. Hmm? People are all talking about the danger of war, of a sudden atomic attack. Two days ago, I was in Ohio. It's a live subject there. Same in New York, on the West Coast, everywhere. Tremendous interest. All of a sudden, according to these reports, it dies out. You're right back at the beginning, Chief. People just don't well, realize... Peters, that. I'm not one of those who blames the people every time something goes wrong. Not until I'm sure nothing else is wrong. Peters, how many of our agents are now unassigned in the first classification? Oh, maybe ten or a dozen. Well, Good. Get those men together tonight here in my office. You'll be here, too. I see you've got a scheme. Yes, that's right. Now, from all these reports, we're going to pick out the localities having the most trouble. Then you fellows are going into those cities undercover to join the civil defense groups as ordinary citizens to find out, if you can, what's wrong. <laughs> Frankly, I, I must admit, ladies and gentlemen, I've, I've had to turn in a disappointing report to City Defense Headquarters. Not, not about you who are here, but about those who have been dropping out. And so tonight, I've, I've got to ask you to get in touch with everyone you know. Find out why they seem so uninterested in what we're doing here. And Sir, Mr. It. Blair! Yes, Mr. Crane? I can tell you right now what's eating everybody. I mean, those who aren't here. Oh, can you? I've talked to lots of people trying to get them in here to work, and they all say, what's the use? Nothing's ready. We're not getting the help we need from Washington. And I tell them, well, it's up to us, oh, too. Uh, excuse We've got... me, please. Uh, yes? If you'll allow me to interrupt the other speaker. Well, yes, go ahead. Well, I agree with what he says. People just don't have any faith in the civil defense outfits. And my name is Peterson. I've just come to Finsburg. I'm a reporter on the Finsburg Press. And let me tell you, we are helpless. And I just don't see any point in continuing... Excuse me, Mr. Peterson, but I don't see any point in discouraging ourselves. And that's what we're doing, some of us. Oh, it's intended to help, I know, Well, if you're we... just trying to protect a bunch of Washington incompetents, Mr. Blair, I don't see why... The I'm protecting no one, Mr. Peterson. We're all trying to protect ourselves. 
All right, that's all for tonight. I'll see you all on more, I hope, on Friday. Say, Peterson. Peterson. Yeah? Uh, my name's Steve Crane. I'm the guy you cut in on. Oh. <laughs> well, I hope you weren't so, huh? Oh, on the contrary. Glad to see somebody else here with the nerve to talk up. Uh, say, are you, um, are you busy the rest of the evening? No. You and me seem to agree on a lot of things. Why don't you come on home with me for a drink and, uh, see what else we agree on? Hmm? Don't go yet, Mr. Peterson. Can't I give you another drink? No, 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 thanks, Mrs. Crane. It's really time I went home. Oh, I'm glad you came home with me, Peterson. Glad to know you and me see eye to eye on a lot of this civil defense stuff. You bet, Crane. Well, thanks for a very pleasant evening, Mrs. Crane. Maybe you'll come again. Give us a ring any time. I'll certainly bear that in mind. Uh, this way, huh? Yeah, I'll just do it. Good night. Good night. Well, what do you make of him, Della? Seems to have his heart in the right place. Last two or three meetings, he's been backing me up, and good, too. Great little discourager. And all the time, he sounds like the doggondest eager beaver you ever heard. Maybe he'd make a super-American. That's what I thought. It's time I tipped Mr. Hector anyway. He ought to be coming here to Finsburg for a general look-see, and that's when he can meet Peterson. You are listening to the case of the Double Crossing Defender on Counter Spy. Today, over most NBC stations, Cary Grant and Betsy Drake star in the premiere of a delightful newcomer to your NBC Sunday lineup, Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. It's top listening for the entire family with Mr. and Mrs. Blandings in that troublesome dream house. Sunday also means another broadcast of The Big Show. And today, your hostess, Tallulah, presents Fred Allen. Judy Holliday, Vaughn Monroe, and many, many more. Now, back to Counter Spy. From Peters, assignment Finsburg to David Harding, Washington. Chief cause of civil defense difficulty here, one Steve Crane, member of apparently patriotic group called Super America Incorporated. Mrs. Crane says Chief Super American Henry Harrison Hector of Baltimore arriving here soon. Advise. Harding to Peters. Spot check of 11 civil defense groups shows similar activity by persons belonging to Super America Incorporated and flying to Finsburg. Press, Mr. Harding. I've been assigned to interview you about your trip here. Oh, well, I don't see any other reporters, Mr. Uh... Peterson, Mr. Harding. I guess I'm the first man here. I had an inside tip that you might be on this plane. Oh. Uh, I wonder if we could just step away from the crowd here. Of course. Uh, tell me, uh, how long do you expect to stay in our city, Mr. Harding? Uh, long enough to survey the civil defense organizations here. Chief, this fellow Henry Harrison Hector is arriving in Pittsburgh in a couple of days. Anything about Super America Incorporated? Well, it described itself as a super patriotic organization, but its literature follows the Communist Party line like one snake after another. Mm-hmm. Well, how's that tie in with what you know of Crane and his wife? There are a couple of smarties, Dave. Crane gets in his dirty work by seeming to be a real eager beaver. Mm-hmm. His wife has joined up, too. She does the same, but actually they discourage people. That seems to be the idea. Probably following a national pattern. Well, uh uh-oh. Here come reporters from the other papers. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Harding, and lots of luck to you in your stay here. I'll be at the Riverside Hotel, Peter. Right. Okay, Peterson, tell your paper to get behind this campaign to step up civil defense. So long. And here, Mr. Hector, here's a layout of the Civil Defense Control Center. Mm Hmm. Very complete. Steve's work. He's good at that sort of thing. He's down there tonight doing extra volunteer work, if you know what I mean. Mm. These are the main phone lines? The trunks run into the basement here. Mm. Main water valve there. Mm. Main power line here, and main switch next to it. Radio room? Um, second floor. 
Hmm. Good setup, Steve says. Modern equipment. Big control board to keep in touch with radio hands in the city in case of attack. Medical department. Hmm. Hmm. Aircraft spotting room. Third floor. Phone communications with 100 observation posts in a big ring outside the city. And uh, here. Hmm. Director's office. This man, Blair. We have a file on him and also his staff. Good. Liaison with police and fire departments, public health authorities, welfare and public information. Transportation here. Big garage, trucks, and so on. A depressingly efficient setup, Dylan. Sure. But what good is it? Unless the civil defense people themselves are really pepped up. And they're not. Your plan has been working beautifully. And so I've heard from many other cities. It's lucky because actually these defense setups are good. If we can only keep the people so discouraged, they don't use them to the fullest advantage. That's where I thought this man Peterson might come in. We can always use new recruits. Have you checked on him? No, I haven't had the time. I hoped you might from Baltimore. He's an unknown, Della. I think we better... Ch- Would that be... I hope so. Put away that map, hmm? Yeah. Good evening, Mrs. Crane. I'm afraid I'm a few minutes late. Hello. Come on in. Thank you. This is Harry Peterson, and this is Mr. Henry Harrison Hector, National Chairman of Super America Incorporated. How do you do, sir? Sit down, Mr. Peterson, and let's have a long, honest talk, shall we? Mr. Harding, Peterson of the Finsburg Press. Oh, hello, Peterson. Tonight I met the man, H.H.H., the scheme is to destroy civil defense morale. I gave him a lot of personal detail based on New York City. The same we've used before in similar cases. As I understand. I'll wire New York to back you up. If HHH is on the level, he'll drop you because of your supposed record as a subversive. But if he's not on the level... We'll see. I'll check you tomorrow. Good night. <laughs> lost no time checking on me. It was three nights ago that I first met him. Tonight I had a call to meet him at the Crane's apartment. Then he wants you in spite of your fake subversive record. He may be our man. Right. Well, I understand there's to be a test alert very soon. I hope we can run this down before that. Steve, as I understand your duties at the control center, you are a guard at the main entrance. That's right, Mr. Hector. And Della? Volunteer assistant at the medical center. And our friend Peterson? Information center, assistant to the director. I've been thinking, and as super Americans, we must always think ahead of everyone else. An ordinary test alert is no test at all because everyone knows it's fake. Now, what if we make this a real alert? By spreading the alarm during the test that it's the real thing. That's taking a chance, Mr. Hector. At an appropriate moment, suddenly give a a false report. Start shouting, it's the real thing, a real attack. You understand? Brother. There'll be a panic. People injured and killed, Mr. Hector. Suppose it were the real thing. People would be killed, would they not? You can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. Very well. That's all. Uh, Peterson, you leave first. Okay. Good night, all. See you at the test, whenever it is. I uh, gather you got an okay report on Peterson, Mr. Hector? Yes, from New York. Mm -hmm. He's going to be a valuable man. I'll get a dollar. No, never mind, Steve. Hello? Yes, Mr. Hector is right. Oh. Are you sure? Yes, I'll tell him. Thanks. Goodbye. Huh? That call was from New York, Mr. Hector. They checked further on Peterson. He's not all he said he was. What? He may be some kind of undercover agent. Oh, what a dumb mistake for us to make. No regrets now. Steve. Yeah? During the test alert, see to it that Peterson is one of the people killed in the panic. That ought to be easy. And when I... Hey, what the... The lights are blinking. Steve, that's the first signal for the alert. We've got 15 minutes to get to our post. Then get going. And remember your orders. Radio operators to your sectors in disaster area 
4. Radio operators, disaster area 4. Medical corps and ambulances to medical post 7 and 13. 7 and 13. Report to communications on arrival. Trucks for utilities repair. Trucks for utilities repair to the boundaries of disaster area 4. Turn off gas and power lines to prevent explosions. Reopen block sewers. Guides for injured and homeless. Stay in your vehicles till you reach rallying points. Guide injured and homeless to shelters 9, 11, and 17. 9, 11, and 17. Everything going all right, Blair? So far, yes, Mr. Harding, but... Oh, here's one of the men I was telling you about. The one that's always spreading discouragement. Oh. His name's Peterson. Hello, Mr. Blair. Oh, Mr. Harding, can I speak to you, sir? Yes? I just Blair, came from meeting Hector, Chief. They're going to start a panic, and it's a real attack. It's a real fifth column trick. I'll get 17. All right, I'll alert one of our squads outside. Hey, listen, everybody! This is no fake attack, it's real! That's Steve Crane following orders. The first bomb hit the suburbs. There's nothing left of him. There's nothing we can do. Save yourselves! The next bomb will hit the middle of the city. Save yourselves! No, wait, wait, everybody. Stand by your posts. No matter what happens, stand by your post. Don't listen to that fool. Save yourself. Chief, that's Hector himself among the crowd. Where's your way near him, Peter? Men, women, listen to this. This is Harding, United States Counter Fire. Wait, listen to Mr. Harding. Now, don't be panicked by a rumor. This is the time to prove you're well disciplined. Don't let anyone leave this room or the building. All right, back to you. Now, Mr. Blair, check your outpost. Right. Zone director to all spotters. Have any real bombs been dropped? Any real bombs? Not one, Mr. Harding. You see, it was a rumor, a deliberate rumor by fifth columnists trying to start a panic. Crane was caught at the door, Mr. Harding, and here's the boss of the bunch, Henry Harrison Hector. Well, the chief super-American himself. Mr. Harding, you misunderstand our purpose. We wanted to make this a real test. Well, that's too bad for you, Hector. One of your newest recruits is going to be the star witness against you and your organization. Take him away, Peter. Come on, Hector. Mr. Harding, I'm very grateful for your help. But are we past the danger? Well, as long as there's danger of war, Blair, there's the danger of fifth column. And the best protection against them is vigilance and courage. You've done it here. I know every American can do it. Tonight's Counter-Spy program originated in New York, was directed by Marks B. Loeb, dramatized by Paul R. Milton, and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer. Lionel Rico speaking. Counter-Spy is a Phillips H. Lord production. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. In a moment, Cary Grant and Betsy Drake star in the premiere of a delightful newcomer to your NBC Sunday lineup, Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. It's top listening for the entire family with Mr. and Mrs. Blandings and their troublesome dream house. Sunday also means another one-hour production by Theater Guild on the air. It's the delightful comedy, The Fortune Hunter, starring Gene Crane and John Lund. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.